Well, with those thoughts, let me just get to, you know, what the Lord has laid in my heart this morning to speak. And I was wondering whether is this the message? Because whenever I come, I would like to speak something on family. Somehow, some illustration, something will come on family with whatever I speak. That's a different story. But this was not a family-related message. And I was wondering whether this was the right word for this church this morning. And uh, the person who came to pick me up and our conversation confirmed it. He said, Pastor, I've been wanting to grow more and uh, there has been a big thirst in me and I said to myself today's message is for you you know so that way I believe you know this has been confirmed and I pray that this will be of help to each one of us there was this psychiatrist who every day you know before I mean every time he meets his patients in his ward he he gives some exercise to find out how good they are doing now so he had one exercise one of the weeks, and that was he told them, you are going on a cycle race. So he made all his psychiatric patients to stand in a straight line and asked them to imagine they are riding a cycle. And he said, when I say on the mark, get set, go, you all have to imagine you are riding your bicycle and you have to go to the other end. So he made everybody stand and everybody was you know, standing there in the position of almost riding a bicycle. And he said, on the mark, get set, go. And you can just imagine the chaos. One went that side, one went this side, one went in the front, one went behind. And some were trying their bell, kining, 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 and doing different things and checking out. Except one guy. He didn't move. He was just holding and standing like this. So the psychiatrist went and asked him, how come when all of them are going, you are not even moving? He said, shh, don't disturb me. I'm going down the hill. <laughs> the psychiatrist thought at least one fellow has become a little better. But it was worse. Many times in our spiritual walk, when you think you are doing very well, that's when you have to be careful. Maybe you're going down the hill. When everything is chalta hai, when everything is going on well, how are you doing spiritually? Chalta hai, pastor. Going on well. Theek hai. Okay. If this is your answer, probably you need to ask yourself, are you going down the hill? Because with the Lord, every day is a new adventure. With the Lord, every day is a new experience. And with the Lord, every day, there is an excitement to keep traveling that road. And so if it is just going on kind of a spirituality, then we need to pause and ask, are we doing the right thing? And this morning, I'm led to speak on this 5D growth plan, like we have the 5G you know, 5D also is good, five dimension. When I was looking at, is there any significance of fifth dimension? And uh, if you have done some physics, you will understand, you know, those are uh, thoughts that is much beyond time and space, you know. So 5D is definitely appropriate for us because we are talking about a different dimension, not just for this world, for the spiritual world. How do I kept, keep my spiritual life growing? Spiritual life growing. By the way, before I start talking about it, one question I want to ask, why do we want to grow spiritually? What is the purpose for growing spiritually? You can ship that, please. Yeah. Next one. Yeah. Why do you want to grow spiritually? Now, if you read Ephesians chapter 3 and the, the book of Ephesians, you know, Paul is talking about how he wants everybody to be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. In chapter 3 verse 14, he says, you know, for this reason I, uh, uh, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name and he prays that, you know, that they all will be Filled to the measure of the fullness of God. That's where the prayer ends in, in, in verse 19. 
that he prays that everybody will be so filled to the measure of the fullness of God. You know, and then he goes on, you know, in chapter 5, verse 8, you know, sorry, chapter 4, verse 13, he says, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Why do we want to grow in Christ? That we will attain to the measure of the fullness of Christ. So in other words, in simple term, why are we wanting to grow spiritually? It is to become like, like Jesus, isn't it? It is to become like him, that we grow spiritually in order that we be like him. So that when you see his lovely face, face to face that we sang right now, you don't need to be embarrassed. You have been washed by his blood and you have grown in him. That you have grown to the maturity, the fullness of him. That you will be like him. And that's the purpose for which God wants us to grow in him. So, if you are still with the understanding of Christ at the time when you probably committed your life to Christ, or, you know, if you are stuck with the Sunday school understanding of Jesus Christ, I would ask you to grow up. And we all need to grow up. We cannot be satisfied by milk. That's what the word of God reminds us. You have to eat meat. And we all need to grow up in our relationship with Christ that the more you know him, the more you love him, the more you are with him, you will be like him. And that's our desire, my dear friends. So I want to quickly talk about five aspects from Ephesians chapter, uh, uh, chapter f- the 5. Uh, from verse 8 to 18. I want to keep that as my focus point to look at five aspects of how to grow in your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The first one that I want to talk about is discover what pleases Him. In verse 8, it says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Find out what pleases the Lord. Now, I like the way Paul describes here by saying, you were once darkness. He doesn't say once you were living in darkness. You were once darkness, which means without Jesus Christ, however righteous you think you are, you are darkness. Only in Jesus you have the light. Without Jesus Christ, however good your activities are, you are still in darkness. And here Paul is saying, you were once darkness, but now you are light. In other words, he is not saying now you are walking in the light. You are light, which means you will shine. Which means through you, many people will understand what is the light of Jesus. And he's saying, you are light. And then he goes on to say, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Which means what? If you are the light, in fact, there is only one I am statement, you know, seven I am statements Jesus said. I'm the bread of life. I'm the truth. I'm the way. But one thing he said about himself is also, I'm the light. But... This is the only I am statement that he has shared with us. He has not shared this I am statement with, you know, other I am statement. You know, he said, I am the bread of life. You are also the bread of life. He didn't say that. But when it came to light, he said, I am the light. And then he said, you are the light of the world. This is the only I am statement that he has shared with us. And what he's saying here, he's saying, and Paul is taking that up and saying, if you are a person Living in the light of God, one way you will be known is by your fruit. You cannot, and you know one thing? Light does not need any advertisement. You don't need to say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, walk around. You know, when they see you, they will know you are a Christian because of the fruit you bear. 
And what is the fruit that the Bible is talking about here? He's saying, but and the, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Now, when I looked at all the three categories, I would call, you know, now the famous GST is there everywhere. This is GRT, goodness, righteousness, truth. Okay, this GRT, all these three are not something that you can earn by doing something. The goodness of God, the righteousness of God, the truth of God is shared by God to us. By His grace, He gives us His goodness. That's why Jesus, when He was asked, good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus stopped and said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. So goodness, He wants to share with us through the light that comes into you, the goodness of God is in you, the righteousness of God is in you, the truth of God is in you, and you don't need to work at it. It will be something that will be granted to you by which you will bear the fruit of righteousness, bear the fruit of truth, bear the fruit of the goodness of God, which will be noticed by people. So this is what God expects of us. And for that... If that goodness and righteousness and truth of God has to be seen in our life, constantly, on an everyday basis, you have to discover what pleases the Lord. Don't assume this is what God is pleased with. You know, you need to discover, find out what pleases the Lord. Which means what? There is an effort that you have to put in, isn't it? Every day in the morning, you'll have to sit with the Lord and say, Lord, what do I do to please you today? You have to read his word and obey him. The only way to please him is to obey him. If you love me, you will keep my commands. That's what he says. So unless and otherwise we are diligent about pleasing him, you cannot please him. I will live my life the way I want and God will be, will be pleased with it. That doesn't work that way. You have to be intentional about pleasing Him. Two brothers wanted to please the Lord. The first brothers in the Bible. Cain and Abel. About whose sacrifice was, Jesus, was God pleased? Abel's or Cain's? We are confused. Anyway, Abel. But Cain's, he was not pleased. Both? Sacrificed, both gave, but one he was not pleased. So you need to find out what pleases the Lord. Don't assume, okay, if I give this, he will be pleased. Because that fellow gave, I will also give. No, it doesn't work that way. Give unto the Lord as what God wants you to do. Not because you saw a neighbor doing it. And that's what happened in that story of Ananias and Sapphira. You know that? He saw Barnabas giving and he thought, I will also give. It was not pleasing the Lord at all. So how are we in discovering? And I believe if you want to discover what pleases the Lord, you will have to spend some time with him. And if you have not been spending time with God, you are not going to find out. If you are only going to give your two hours or one and a half hours on a Sunday morning to the Lord and then expect everything else to be revealed, it is not going to be revealed. I'm sorry to say this. Not because I don't believe God will speak you in the, to, to you this morning, but the process of discovery is not one revelation like this. You have to research it. You have to work on it. You have to spend your time with God. And my dear friends, Today, we are all very busy bodies. We don't have time for God, isn't it? Running morning to evening for so many things when we are all exhausted and when everything is so tired and tiring, then we say, please read. Because somehow we got into our consciousness without prayer, we shouldn't sleep. So, like an apple a day keeps the doctor away, we think something in the evening we should do to keep the devil away. <laughs> My dear friends, if your family prayer is a ritual, you will not discover. 
If your quiet time is a ritual, you will not discover. You will have to be intentional. Lord, tell me, Lord, what pleases you today? That I will obey you today. And unless and otherwise, we are intentional about it. Not some ritualistic righteousness that we are talking. We are talking about a relationship with the Lord. For that, you need to spend time. You know, many of our divorces are increasing because husbands have no time for the wife and wife has no time for husband. And slowly, you know, we will get divorced from the Lord also if we don't spend the needed time. So, discovering requires you to spend time. And the Bible says, without holiness, you cannot please God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 to 11, 4, 4, to, uh, 4, 1 to 8. You know, it says, but for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more, for you know what instruction we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you be sanctified, that you avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans do who do not know the Lord, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you uh, as we told you and warned you before, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, very God, who gives you his spirit. So, my dear friends, here is Paul urging the church at Thessalonica and telling them, hey, listen, you know, you have to live a life pleasing to God. Sanctify yourself. Live a holy life. And by you living a holy life is what you can please God. Because without holiness, you cannot see God. Without holiness, you cannot please God. So your life has to be a sanctified life. And when you were singing the songs and when we were worshipping the Lord, I was telling myself, Lord, all these promises that we are claiming, this can only become true in your life when your life is in tune with Him. If our life is not in tune with Him, and if we just live a duplicate life, and if we just live a so-so Christian life, that is not going to really, you know, be appropriated adequately into your life. For that to, for these promises to be fulfilled in our life, our life has to live, be, be tuned to Him, be sanctified. It pleases God for you to live a sanctified life. So, all these things are only possible when you spend time, when you spend time with Him. So, I don't know if the Lord is reminding some of you, you've not been adequately spending time. You've been quickly, you've been neglecting your time with the Lord. You've been neglecting your time in, as a family. Maybe this is a time the Lord is reminding you, bring it back. Bring it back. Put that in order so that you will grow in the fullness, to the full measure of Him. You know, this is not doing God a favor. This is actually doing you a favor so that you will really enjoy Him and His blessings in your life. Nothing else. Let's move on to the next one. The second thing that I want to leave with you is discard fruitless deeds of darkness. You know, here he says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. For everything exposed by the light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. He's saying, have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness. Now, the problem most of the time I find is, we have not made our boundaries clear. We have kept some gray areas. We have kept some space where you are neither here nor there. You have not put, you know, made your stand very clear. Where do you stand? Are you with the Lord or are you with the devil in between? 
Sunday sacred life, Monday to Saturday secret life. This doesn't work. Sunday is sacred, Monday to Saturday very, very sacred. Your workplace will be a sacred place because you are there who knows the light and who loves the Lord and who is living that light. Don't make, don't desecrate that place of work. God has asked you to be the light there. And when there are deeds of darkness, you will deny it completely. You will discard it. You will not hang around it. Again, I do not know if there's somebody who's been struggling. Yes, Sunday, you hear the word, you're excited, but when you go back, you're back to the world. You're living your own life. You're not living according to what you heard on a Sunday. If that is you, my dear friend, let me remind you again, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve two masters. The Lord is urging you to serve Him and be committed to Him and Him alone. Today we need godly men and women who live out that light. Many of you don't need to go and do much evangelism. All you need to do, especially in a nation like this, which has restricted you by law, just live it out. And people will want to follow Jesus because you live out. You know, in our board, we have an uncle who was an ex-customs commissioner, deputy commissioner. And he says his nickname in his office was Jesus. His nickname is Jesus. He'll say, you know, if there's anything, they'll say, go and talk to Jesus. I believe one day there is a lady who came into his room, you know, somebody, you know, said, yeah, you talk to that Jesus, you know. And she really thought that's his name. So she entered the room and said, can I talk to Jesus? And he was sitting, <laughs> he was telling us that story and she was falling at his feet because of some issue that happened. And, and he had to kind of intervene and talk and because everybody is asking so much of bribe. And he's saying to live there as a Christian is challenging. So everybody finally calls him Jesus. I wish there is Jesus in every company here. Hallelujah. And that can only happen when we discard fruitless deeds completely, my dear friends. Don't hang on with fruitless deeds. You and me are called to expose darkness, not to somehow recommend darkness. And thirdly, uh, if you really want to know what are the lists, you can go and read at home. This is your quiet time passage for tomorrow morning. Galatians 5, 19 to 21. You know, the sinful nature are obvious. All these lists. And you can ask yourself, where do I belong? What is it happening to me? Is it is sexual immorality? Is, this, is it impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft? Maybe you won't go there. Witchcraft, okay. Hatred? Discord? Ah, those are things that is there. Factions? Dissensions? Fits of rage? Anger? By the way, we did a survey among 200 missionary couples to see how their family life is. Literally 70% of them, they struggle with anger. Isn't that a painful thing? Fits of rage is in the list of what? Deeds of darkness. <laughs> so, if you are boasting, you know, when I get angry, I get angry. After that, I am like a sadhu. Hello. If you are telling that and escaping every time. That is not deeds of the light. You better work on it. Ask the Lord to help you. Control your anger. Because the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. 
And unless and otherwise we work on these aspects, he's saying you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that's very dangerous for us. And that's, let's move to the next one. The third D that I want to leave with you is discreet use of time. Discreet use of time. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Look at the word that is used. Be very careful then. You know, the Bible is telling, be very careful. Is it a request or a command? It's a command. The Bible is saying, be careful. Don't mess up. Be careful that you don't fall. Be careful that you don't, you know, make, take this light. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a warning. Be very careful how you use your time. I'm told that literally five hours of our productive time nowadays goes in looking at WhatsApp and other things in the mobile. The way we use our time, you know, constantly we keep getting messages, forwards, that one, this one. We have time for all that. 15 minutes in the presence of God to read God's word seems to be very difficult, isn't it? How many WhatsApp messages we watch every day? To re read every day. My dear friends, Satan is very cunning. And that's why he's saying, because the days are evil. In other words, the evil one is working out various ways to make you distracted in using your time effectively. So if you want to grow spiritually, discreet use of your time. I will spend only for this. I will not spend time for this. I will only do this. I will not do this. You need to put a list of no's, don'ts and do's. If you don't put a list, you will be doing everything which you don't need to do. And what you have to do, you won't end up doing. So what are the things that the Lord is asking you not to do? Please put a list and discard it. Throw it out. Redeem your time. This is how uh, King James Version says. Redeem your time. Which means what? It's almost somebody is trying to take it. You redeem it from him. Redeem it from him. Redeem the time from the evil use of it. Making use of every opportunity. Time and tide waits for no man. We know that, right? And if time is such a precious gift God has given, you know, this last three years we know the preciousness of time. Many people whom we thought will be alive today are not alive. Time is gone like this. They can't believe it. One little virus came into somebody's body and that person is packed and gone. In the little time that we have, my dear friends, this is all what we have in this world and the rest is eternity. If we are not redeeming our time, we will be accountable. One of our students who's doing MA, you know, did a, did a research among a, one church and he took 30 couples as a sample size to find out, you know, how do they use their mobile phone for? What are the things that they regularly do? And this is all in a church that too in down south, conservative place, you know. He took one church to see how they are and zero to ten years of marriage, young couples. To his surprise, and of course my surprise as his guide, I realized the highest usage of the mobile phone was for pornography. He thought some devotional songs or something will be there. <laughs> for pornography in one church. A sample size from one church. He thought this is a very conservative church. 
And because he was an outsider, people were honest to say what they are doing with their mobiles. And the maximum was for pornography. Now, I won't be surprised if this is done in any other church today. Redeem the time from the evil use of it because the evil man has been trying to take away our time, our mind, our energy into the wrong direction. And unless and otherwise you make a decision this morning and say, Lord, I'm not going to waste my time. Just a week back, you know, three, four days back before I came here, uh, one of my seminary students, he came and said, Sir, I want to mention this very quickly before you leave. He said, I was in your class. He was being trained to be a pastor. I had an addiction with pornography, and I was in your class with the same addiction, and I was struggling. And I remember in your class, you spoke about it. And that's the last day that I touched it. And he's talking to me after almost 10 plus years. He said, praise God, I want to tell. I wanted to tell you earlier, but I wasn't confident. I wanted to wait and see. And he said, 10 years now, sir. Now, this is not one story, my dear friends. I can tell you so many stories of people within the body of Christ, in the leadership, who are being trained to be pastors. Now, if that is the deceptiveness of the enemy. So don't take him lightly. And don't play with fire thinking, oh, this is little bit here, little bit there. Say no to ungodliness. Throw away everything that hinders your race. Otherwise you will be caught. So put that very, very clear. My time is also going. So let me, you know, quickly move to the next one. Discerning his will. Discerning his will. That's the fourth D that I want to leave with you. Because it says, you know, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. You know, if you really want to grow in your spirit, spiritual life, you need to discern his will on a daily basis. On a daily basis, discern his will. You know, we all love this verse. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans for a good future, isn't it? Now, if, if that is God's plan, fit into his plan. Don't think you know the plans you have for yourself and God should sign it off. You know, many of us, you know, how do we do it? Whatever we prayed for, we think that has become God's will. I prayed, brother. I prayed so much for that. And so I went and did it. We asked them, how did you decide on this? Why did you get married to this person? I prayed. Now you think once you prayed, everything will get sanctified. No, 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 no. You know, many times we write all our desire and then take it to God and say, you please sign this. So that you can get an endorsement from him. But that's not the way to do it. You give a white paper to God. And say, Lord, you write whatever you want. And I will sign it. It's a totally different game. When we try to discern his will, his plans, his thoughts for my life, it is not about what I want to achieve for him. It's what he wants to achieve for me. So that his plans will happen in my life for his glory. Amen. Praise God. I really wish that each of us will become discerning people. Don't get into that, this, whether you're, it's an investment that you're making, whether it is a partner you're choosing, whether it is something else that you're doing or you're making a decision in your office. Come on, ask the Lord, pray, discern. Should I go here? Paul was so much urging to go and finish all that he had planned and suddenly the Spirit of God said, no, 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 you're not going there. Go here. He had a vision and he changed the direction. Allow the Lord to interrupt your plans. Allow the Lord to tell you, hey, this is not the plan. This is the plan. Again, because of the lack of time, I could have given you more stories to tell you. You know, how many times I have not discerned. 
I'm not standing here as a person who knows everything. I've not discerned. I thought because I prayed, everything will work out. So I ended up having six times my visa rejected to go to U.S. <laughs> because my admission was waiting. My, you know, admission with scholarship was waiting. So I thought it's God's will. And every time I went, I got rejected. I told God, God, what are you doing with my life? And the Lord had to remind me, that's because it's your life. You think you can do what you want. It's a life given by me for you. And I know the plans. But when he fulfilled his plan, it was much more than what I had planned. Much, much more. I was only applying for a, you know, MTH course. But when the Lord accomplished his plans, he was taking me for a doctorate with fully paid even for my flight ticket. And my visa. When we allow him to write his plan and when I sign it off, it's a very different thing. So let him do it for you. And lastly, with that I close. The last thing that I want to talk about, the Bible says, do not be drunk on wine which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit Instead, be filled with the Spirit of God. The fourth, fifth thing, daily be filled with the Spirit of God. My dear friends, the, you know, just to show little scholarliness, you know, the tense that is used there, you know, in Greek, based on the tense, you understand what kind of, whether it's present tense, past tense, continuous, you know, it's called in Greek, there's something called aorist tense. An aorist tense, be filled. You know, the word used there is aorist tense, which means it's a present continuous tense. It is not once you are filled and that's it for life. Ah, oh, that day I was filled with the spirit, brother. That day I filled. No, 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 no. That day is one day. Today what happened? <laughs> How are you? It is a daily filling of his spirit in your life. As you get thirsty, you go to him. Whoever is thirsty, come to me. And thirstiness is not only one time. It keeps happening, isn't it? You drank with water in the morning, you again feel thirsty after some time. You keep going to him. And so every day you are in his presence asking the Lord, Lord, fill me with your presence. Fill me with your power. Fill me with your grace so that I will be an overflow of who you are. I don't want to be an overflow of PC Matthew. I want to be an overflow of Jesus to the others. And that's how it works, my dear friends. Because when pressures of life comes, what happens is what you are filled with will only come when you're tilted. Isn't it? When the tilting happens suddenly, suddenly you never expected this. Your job is gone. Suddenly you never expected this. Something goes wrong at home with your child. When the tilting happens, what overflows shouldn't be of you. Should be of the spirit who is filling you. And that is why Jesus, when he is at the height of his pain, when he was crucified, could say, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. He was not hurling insults. He was not declaring what I can do when I come back. He was only asking for forgiveness. And I believe even this morning, as we have heard God's word, ask the Lord to fill you afresh and go back as filled people and not just wait for next Sunday to come and get filled again, but every day in your home, ask the Lord to fill you afresh. So that you will be an overflow of Jesus wherever God is placing you. So five things that we looked at. The summary, discover what pleases God. Discard the fruitless deeds. Discreet use of your time and opportunity. Discern His will and daily be filled. I pray that this will become our story of how we live for God's glory and for his purposes. Amen. Let's look to the Lord in prayer.
Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Break me, melt me, mold me, and fill me, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Let's make this our prayer this evening. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on Break me, Lord. Let's sing it. Break me, mold me, fill me, and use me, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Yes, Lord, this is our prayer. Fill us, Lord, to the brim that we will overflow of you, Lord. We want to grow in you, Lord. What we know of you is not enough, O oh Father. We want to know you more, O oh Father. We want to love you more, O oh Father. Give us more grace to deny those, Lord, deeds of darkness in our life. And give us the grace to, Lord, walk with you, O oh Father. Hold your hand, O oh Father. And move in the direction that you have for us. So that we will fulfill the purpose and the plan of God in our life. To the end we surrender ourselves Lord. We fall prostrate O oh Father. As you reminded us Lord from Romans chapter 12 verse 1 and 2. Lord that we want to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to God. Because this is our spiritual act of worship. So Lord we want to worship you by offering ourselves Lord. Use us for your glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.